question time tonight, Bernard Jenkins, Shadow Defence Secretary. George Galloway, Labour MP, vehement opponent of war with Iraq. Mark Oten, Chairman of the Liberal Democrats in the House of Commons. And Anne Leslie, award-winning special correspondent for the Daily Mail. And, um, good evening, welcome to Tamworth. If you're observant, you may have noticed we're missing Jermaine Greer, who was going to be here, but got stuck in a snowdrift in Cambridge, so she'll have to come some other week. Um, and just one thing before we start, remember, if you want to comment on what's said during the programme, you can send us a message by texting us to it, uh, it to us, and you can read what other people watching are saying about the programme as it goes along, which can be fun, and the instructions are there on the screen. Let's take our first question to our panel, who has ever don't know what they're going to be asked tonight, and this comes from Nigel Morris, please, Mr. Morris. Why do the Liberals and the left wing of the Labour Party continually undermine the Prime Minister's determination to rid the world of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? Um, well, well don't, don't, don't clap, because I was going to come to you uh, first. <laughs> Bernard Jenkin. Well, that's a question for them, not for me. Well, you uh, must have a view on it. Um, the danger is that uh, uh, the Liberals um, are chasing public opinion polls rather than sticking up pr principle. I mean, there are people, and let's uh, be absolutely blunt about this, there are lots of people with very severe doubts about it, but I have my doubts about the Liberals, because I'm sure when military action comes to be taken, they will be there as they were in Kosovo, as they were in the first Gulf War, as they were in the Falklands. And I think there's a certain amount of political posturing that goes on from the Liberal benches which isn't entirely sincere. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. I think the position we have taken on this has been absolutely principled. Charles Genevieve has made it quite clear from the start that if you are going to maintain peace in this world, you do it through the international institutions, the United Nations. And we in this issue, I believe, have led public opinion. And this is not a cheap issue where we're trying to get votes. We strongly feel this is an important principle to speak up in a way that the official so-called opposition just are not doing at the moment. George, George Galloway. Well, we've got His Holiness the Pope, the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the leader of the British forces who went into Kuwait to liberate Kuwait in the last Gulf War. We've got field marshals by the dozen. Uh, we've got people from all political stripes backing the Stop the War Coalition campaign to stop us going over the cliff with George W. Bush. There must be an awful lot of liberals and left-wing labor people in the country if that question was right because something between 75 and 80 percent of the people of the country agree with us that there is no case for going to war on the basis of the current evidence and on the likelihood of the whole thing turning into a disaster. The truth is we, the Liberals, people like me and the others I've mentioned, speak for Britain. I have a letter in my bag from Count Nikolai Tolstoy a grandee of the conservative right, placing himself under my command <laughs> in the campaign. A man okay. whom I never thought I'd ever even have a conversation with. But that's the breadth of the support that we have across the world, from kings, sheikhs, presidents. Nelson Mandela today made a blistering attack on George Bush and Mr. Blair for the way they're conducting this crisis. Now, I just don't think you can pigeonhole us as liberals and left-wing people. This okay. view is shared across the board. And listen. Well, the, the, the simple answer to the question is because they are oppositionists. You know, I mean, they don't like Tony Blair. I don't like Tony Blair. I think on, uh, on this particular issue, he's probably right. Uh, but I noticed that uh, George is saying he's got, you know, half the world and all the grandees and all the lobbies and all the sort of useful idiots, as Lenin put it, uh, on his side. That's a hell of a I to speak about the Pope. The <laughs> <laughs> A, a and the Daily Mail, whom you worked for. And the Daily They're Mail. Also against the Daily the Mail. She used to work for after that comment, I'd have thought. No, it's exactly. I mean, I don't, I, unlike uh, some people, I don't vote the entire ticket of whatever party and whatever faction um, is, is speaking. Um, I happen to be in a minority at the Daily Mail thinking, on the whole, we do have to do something about Saddam. And it's not because I'm a warmonger. <coughs> I've actually seen war at close quarters in three uh, continents, including in Iraq. It is a horrible thing to see. 
but I think we probably do have to go to war. And it seems to me extraordinary that George, who's always going on about, you know, he's got world opinion on his side and, and so on. I mean, you were saying after 9-11 that there was no evidence that bin Laden was involved with the 9-11 attacks. That's completely untrue. No, I'm sorry, That's I heard you. That's completely untrue. Well, you must have... I said from the first moment it was bin Laden. You said there from was the no evidence. From the first moment. Evidence. I said I'm nothing. I'm sorry, I have time. just run through you a program you did where you said Please don't. there was no evidence the Taliban was involved, there was no evidence this, there was no Taliban. evidence that. And I accused bin Laden in the House of Commons four days after the disaster and when then, the House was recalled. And then... And I said... I despise Osama bin Laden. The difference is I've always despised him. When the right. Americans and the British were giving him guns and money, I despised him. I don't think this little argument is getting us anywhere. Let's revert <laughs> to Iraq. Let me go back to the questioner. What's yes, your I'm, view? I'm sure 90% uh, of the population agreed with Neville Chamberlain when he landed at Croydon Airport Absolutely in 1938. True. Absolutely true. Uh, nevertheless, this man has started two wars, has murdered millions of people in his own country, gassed them, uh, he's killed his son-in-laws, which I can imagine you might want to do. Uh, but this man has to be stopped. Does George Galloway want a million people in the tube in London or something like that with anthrax poisoning uh, provided by uh, Saddam Hussein? George Galloway, do you believe uh, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction? If so, what would you do about them and what do you say to his point? I asked the Iraqi president to let these inspectors in. I hope I wasn't fooling him. I told them that if you let these inspectors in to go through the country to destroy any remaining stocks of weapons of mass destruction, then we can have a diplomatic end to this. It now looks as if George Bush and Tony Blair had decided long, long ago that they were going to invade and occupy okay. Iraq. But, but what I say is this, David, an attack on the London tube, Islamic fundamentalist terrorism, is going to be a much greater danger after you've bombed and burned Iraq and after you've occupied Iraq, then it's still in its well. Benny Jenkins. Well, nobody wants to bomb and burn Iraq. Uh, uh, and even if military action is taken, I hope we will see the very minimum of bombing and burning Iraq. Uh, just as, in fact, it turned out, the people of Afghanistan, the war that you opposed there, there were people dancing in the streets as Kabul was liberated. Well, and I've walked, down, no. I've walked down the streets of Kabul with British soldiers who have been mobbed by an adoring population because it's the British soldiers that brought peace and opened the schools and freed the women in Kabul. And I think that's what we want well, to see in, no. uh, in, in Iraq and Baghdad. And only, if, and it's the choice is, is Saddam Hussein's, if he actively cooperates with those weapons inspectors, if he takes them to the weapons of mass destruction and says, come and film me dismantling these weapons, as they did, in, for example, in Ukraine when they disarmed. South That's Africa. what the weapons inspectors are meant to be doing, George. Just getting the weapons inspectors, you can't expect 180 weapons inspectors to find weapons if they're being deceived by the dictator in but, Baghdad. Uh, okay, hold on, Mark. Can I come to one or two members of the audience? You well, I think many of us are probably very suspicious of George Bush's motives for going to war, but in the week when it was celebrating Holocaust Week, I think we have to stand up and be counted. Okay. And, and you in the, in the fifth row, the white shirt, yes. Um, my, my point is that um, once we, we start this process, once we say we're going to war, that's just the beginning. The battle, there are no battle lines with this. That's my concern. And the terrorist is the man or the woman sitting next to you on the bus. There are no battle lines on it. Yeah. And you, sir, in the second row here. Put quite simply, um, in order to give confidence to the troops and us, the British public, in becoming an aggressor towards um, Iraq, uh, perhaps some of this evidence should be made public. And I'm thinking yesterday that President Bush announced that they're watching materials being moved just prior to a, a weapons inspector's visit. Um, if he's watching it being moved, it's not beyond the wit of man to inform the inspectors yeah. so they can intercept such movements. And as if <laughs> What I think uh, probably surprised and alarmed Saddam was Hans Flix, who is the chief inspector, produced a report saying that we have been deceived in the end, that we have not been told the truth, we have been given the runaround. Now, Hans Flix was somebody who, when he was the head of the atomic agency, uh, which was supposed to be inspecting uh, Saddam's nuclear uh, 
program or non-nuclear program, uh, said that nuclear um, program didn't exist in Iraq. He now admits he was fooled. He's probably fooled now. The problem with constantly saying, why don't we have all the evidence, is because the evidence comes from a lot of people within Iraq and outside Iraq, people who have left, um, which if you reveal it, is going to mean that those people and their families are going to be killed or destroyed or tortured. The fact is there's an enormous amount of missing armory in the, the account, in the 12,200 page account which you're so keen on. Okay. And I think <coughs> that we have to do something before. People what's talk your, about there's your, no what's smoking your reply gun. To this? Yes. That what's a your smoking reply to gun this, is well, once it's been. You found. cannot. You, and the gentleman is absolutely right to say we need to see what this evidence is. Now, we're told that Colin Powell is going to make a PowerPoint presentation next Wednesday to the Security Commission. Now, we need to know what this evidence is. This should be made public. If you're going to actually ask our troops and our democracy to make a decision on something as important as this, we need to see the evidence. If, then, having seen that evidence and the House of Commons votes in favour of military action and we have full UN support, then with a heavy heart, the Liberal Democrats would support that action. But until the case is made, we believe the inspectors should be given much more time to carry on their and work. And much more okay, time, couple, Mr. Dunn, no, to keep on concealing his weapons of mass the, the, destruction, which is the whole point. What, I do wish... Woman, hang on, hang on. The woman in, woman in, in pink there, you, madam. And then I want to take a second question on the same subject. You, madam. Right, this is in relation to what was mentioned earlier by the panel. And I hasten to add that I am neither a racist nor a warmonger. But as someone quite rightly said, that once that first shot fires out in Baghdad, then there are going to be re repercussions throughout this country. An article in Sunday's paper by a correspondent stated that 1,200 British Muslims had gone out to join Al-Qaeda's terrorist training in Afghanistan. Most of them by way of either being killed or through other reasons have been accounted for. A lot have returned to Britain. The special branch are most concerned that about a dozen of these terrorists are now loose in Britain and they okay. are raring to go. All right. And the, the, woman in, the woman in the white pool over there, you went. Lots of then, hold on a second. Yep. A lot of people undoubtedly would like to see Saddam Hussein uh, removed from power. But how do our world leaders expect that to happen? Surely any bombs that the West drop, any troops that go in fighting with all guns blazing, it's only going to be the population that get hurt. Saddam is, is going to hide away in his palace. He's not going to get the bombs hit on him. It's the population that have already been under awful sanctions by their president that are going to suffer okay. once again and it's going to be us that does it to them. The, and the man in the black jacket there, and I'll come to you at the back and then I'm going to take a second question on this. I agree in principle with what Anne Leslie said about protecting your intelligence sources and understand why she says that. At the same time, I found it extremely distasteful that five minutes after hearing George Bush making the link between Al-Qaeda and Iraq, Tony Blair is doing exactly the same thing. And where's the evidence to back it up? It's, it seems that this is the way things are going. Bush says one thing one minute, Blair follows. Without, without Blair appearing to be the poodle that is often portrayed, he's got to start presenting evidence so that we can understand why these things are being said. George Galloway, do you think he's a poodle, the Prime Minister? Well, I don't know what poodles did to get themselves such a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> poodles, poodles, are, uh, po po poodles are inoffensive uh, creatures who, who seldom harm anyone. I'm not sure that the analogy is a good one. But I do wish this Gobelian uh, resort to telling big lies often enough would stop. Hans Blix said the Iraqis were cooperating, and I'm quoting, rather well. The head of the Atomic Agency Inspectorate said that it was not true that Iraq was now trying to rebuild its nuclear weapons potential. They were fooled both last of them, time. Both of, you may think that, but don't They've distort. Don't distort what they actually said by but telling people they said one thing when they Blix, said something Blix different. But Blix did say that he thought that Iraq was lying about its production of nerve agents, mm. and he said it didn't have a genuine Bo acceptance both of, of the disarmament that was both demanded of, them, of it. Both of them are saying what the rest of the governments in the Security Council and the vast majority of people in the world are saying, is that this process has to be given more time. 
After all, the consequences of going to war are very serious for our own sons and daughters that we send into battle, for the thousands of Iraqi children, like little Victoria Columbia, who will be scalded and killed in their homes under the bombs, like the uh, children and old people who are living in terror waiting for the dive bombers at the moment, and the tremendous boost that bin Laden and the other lunatics, the Islamic fundamentalist terrorists, will get from this confrontation of East and West. That's okay. what bin Laden tried to bring about. Right. No, no, hold on. I get, I, okay, I right. I, no, I'm going to go on to another question. You can use it there, perhaps. Uh, let's, I, want, I want to have an, another question on this, on this subject from Thomas Lawrence, please. Mr. Lawrence. Should we let the supposed threat of Saddam Hussein ruin our relationship with European countries such as Fran France and Germany? France and Germany, who uh, have come out at the moment against, and um, other countries in Europe, of course, signed this advertisement or article or whatever it was today. Should we let our relationship with the rest of, well, with European countries be ruined, France and Germany? Mark Oten, you're pro-European. I am. I, I mean, I think we're going to find that probably most of these European countries come around to having basically the same view. The French have an incredible tradition of starting off saying no, they move to maybe, and they nearly always end up saying yes. And I suspect, I suspect we're going to see that's what happens. What I think uh, is important... The no, the Jenkins says that's like the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> well, the Liberal Democrats will actually take a judgment on this issue. Look, Bernard, Bernard's quite happy just to make his mind up and just bypass the United Nations. That is not our position. We will wait and see what the United Nations and the weapons inspectors find. And that has got to be the most sensible All view. All right, let's stick with France and Germany. Um, and Leslie. Yes, well, uh, France, in my view, will come round in the end because it's taking a decision which was purely, and I don't blame it, on its own commercial interests. It has a lot of contracts in Iraq and with Iraqi <coughs> businesses. It also likes very much to cock a snoop at America. That's a sort of standard uh, thing about them. Um, Germany is, has got a very strong pacifist streak because Germany knows very well that when it wasn't pacifist, it plunged Europe into but two world with, wars. Uh, saving your grace, we don't want the history. The no. question is whether we should let our relationship be ruined with these countries. I don't think it will be ruined. I think the French will come around. Once they've done a deal behind closed doors mm. about the sorting out of what the contracts are going to be, what the oil contracts are going to be. I think that France will come round. Germany is a different I issue because the people are very pacifist because of their own experience. Secondly, Gerhard Schroeder won the last election. I covered that campaign simply because he, he said, in no way will we go to war with Iraq. And because he appealed to the pacifist feeling in Germany, that's okay. it. So I think we can ignore those two things because I think they will come round. The woman at the back there in red. The gentleman over here says uh, about ruining the relationship with France and Germany. What relationship with France and Germany? Hey. Hey. The seems to be applauding that. Do you agree with that? Yeah. What? Yeah, because what's, they stitch no, us up all the time, view? don't they? or we won't achieve anything, surely. You think we should be unified? We've got to be unified, surely. Well, I think what Bernard demonstrates, Jenkins. if we were unified, we wouldn't be able to achieve anything because we're independent. It turns out, and because p countries like okay. Spain and Portugal and the Czech Republic and Hungary and Italy that have all signed the support for the American and the British position, it shows their independence is a far better guarantee of our independence than getting into some kind of common foreign policy, which quite clearly couldn't possibly work when we can't agree on fundamental issues like the right. Okay. <laughs> Can we get right over to the right there, to the man at the very back there, um, on the right-hand side, if it's possible to reach him? Yes, it is. Far away. The man in the red jacket. Uh, is it right that Tony Blair and other leaders of other nations can decide whether we go to war or not, or is public opinion important? What about, public opinion important? what about Parliament? I mean, shouldn't Parliament have a vote on this? Shouldn't the MPs who are the democratic elected people to represent you, surely we should have a vote and a say in a full debate in Parliament on this the, issue? But, but weren't you, uh, didn't you accept what the Prime Minister said at Prime Minister's Questions on Wednesday? No, I don't believe that... Well, you don't believe what he said. He said that no. he'd have a vote. And he can't no, yes, but he, I, no, no, not, no, not before it's too late. It's the timing, we've, we've it's the voted, timing at which you have the vote that's critical. We've voted umpteen times on whether it's okay to kill foxes, <laughs> but we've not been allowed a single vote on whether it's okay to kill thousands of people in a row. Okay. The man in blue there. <coughs> you, sir. No, the man in blue, and then I'll come to you. In the, yes. Uh, comment earlier 
about um, carving up of oil resources surely demonstrates that this uh, whole conflict is exactly. not about human exactly. rights or intervention or chemical weapons, but it's about the future of forest oil. Exactly. End of story. The sordid and, reality. And, and, and the man in the fair aisle pullover. My point also. And Leslie let out slip oil. Yeah. And that she did. finished the rest of the argument. No, of course. Did. Of course there's war. Yes. Can I respond to yes, that? Yes, yes, please. Of course this war is partly about oil. Because, frankly, if all that uh, Saddam Hussein produced or his country produced were carrots, nobody would give a toss, frankly, whether he was killing his own people, gassing his own Kurds, and so on. Oil is important. The reason he invaded Kuwait was because he was annoyed with the Kuwaitis for undercutting his ability to charge more for his oil and therefore to be able to <coughs> produce his nuclear <coughs> program and his uh, weapons of mass destruction. Of course it's about oil. Uh, partly about oil, but it is also partly about what they say it's about, and you wouldn't agree, is about weapons of mass destruction. If you have a man who is a psychopath, a murderer, who is in charge of the literal lubricant of modern industrial society, this is incredibly dangerous for us. How many of us arrive by car or who go to schools that are heated by oil or go to hospitals that are heated by oil? When we say it's only about oil, as if it was a trivial issue, it is not a trivial issue. And it seems to me that we have to take into account that he can destroy Western civilization by dominating the oil fields of the Middle East, which have three quarters of the world's oil. Okay, that's fine. Uh, George, very briefly, if you would, and then we, I want we, to We've got a dangerous psychopathic murderer in charge of weapons of mass destruction. He's just got a thumping, he's just got a thumping new majority in General Sharon oh, in Israel. God. And he's got a mountain of I weapons that we gave him. I, but knew that would come the, I wanted to deal with the European question. Mr. Blair said that we were going to be at the heart of Europe. In, we're turning out to be a cancer inside Europe, a tumor acting for American interests inside Europe. To say that we are independent when we're actually synchronizing our policy statements, they're made in Washington, and five minutes later, as the questioner said, you, they're made in London. George. We've become the 51st state of George W. Bush's United States of America. George, it's, it's not for nothing that George is known in political circles as the honorable member for Baghdad South. Well, let, he, is <laughs> acting, uh, uh, he is acting if, in if Iraq. You're, if, if you're not careful, I'll tell people what you're known in, in Fleet Street. A fat old bag, but I don't mind that because that doesn't... That doesn't uh, it's much worse, it's much that worse than that. All right, all right, let's, let's <laughs> cut out this and, uh, and finally, and on the poodle question, <laughs> the poodle yeah, question. <laughs> this is a man who goes and spends Christmas in Baghdad. I spent Christmas in the next beach petals. to Tony Blair in and Egypt. I was waving at him across the okay. sand dunes. Well, it's all very interesting. I'm not sure it's totally <laughs> relevant. Uh, we'll, move, we'll move on to another subject. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, just before we do, question time next week is going to be in Dartmouth in Devon. Uh, a week after that we're going to be in Carnarvon in Wales. Now we'd like you to come very much to those question times and if you'd like to, the thing to do is simply to ring us. The number's on the screen now. Uh, 090 11 or you can of course as always apply on our website bbc.co.uk slash question time. You can argue about these issues there too and you'll see your views published and do keep your questions coming uh, or remarks coming by texting us in the way that's described on the screen. Let's have another question now. This one is from Joanna Carey, please. Joanna Carey. Did the wrongful conviction of Sally Clark confirm that there is no presumption of innocence for mothers of cot death victims? The wrongful conviction of Sally Clark, did it confirm no presumption of innocence for mothers of cot death victims? Uh, Bernard Jenkin. Well, what I find so distressing about this whole case is how what is obviously a terrible family tragedy <coughs> finishes up with police and handcuffs and the Crime Prosecution Service and the whole weight of the law being thrown around uh, just to investigate what's happened. And it seems to me we need to look at how we approach these cases, that it's not necessarily somewhere for the law to intervene immediately, uh, that the suspicion of the commission of a crime tends to drive out the perhaps more humane responses and more humane investigation that should have taken place to avoid this injustice in the first place. And I think we need to have a, a long, long look at uh, the whole law that surrounds this. I don't entirely follow. Are you saying that 
uh, two cop deaths shouldn't be followed up by the police. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm what I'm suggesting is that the law of murder and a police investigation might not necessarily the, be the best institutions to follow up uh, two cop deaths. What, what might be more appropriate is a far softer approach because I don't think many, many mothers uh, go around intentionally murdering their children unless there is some terrible, terrible problem in that family or there's some illness. I, I, I think that is the lesson of this case. I don't pretend to be an expert, but, but when uh, I, I read about it in the papers this morning and heard about it on the radio, I, I just couldn't help feeling that there should have been something more humane in this case. Joanna Carey, you asked a question. You, you're a, are you a lawyer or a law student? No, I'm a law student. Law student. What do you think? Well, I think that it's very difficult to prove that you haven't killed a child. If, if the onus of proof is on the mother, how on earth is she supposed to do that? If the medical experts can't agree that what the child died of, how can she refute that? And Leslie? Joanne, I think the main problem is that we don't actually know quite enough about cop deaths. I mean, for example, recently geneticists have been discovering that um, a child is extremely vulnerable to infection about 8 to 12 weeks after the child has been weaned because you inherit a lot of your mother's immune system uh, to begin with. Then if the immune system of the child doesn't kick in at that point, then they are very, very uh, susceptible to infections. And uh, most cop deaths occur during that time. We're learning a lot more about cop deaths. I don't know whether it's a question of whether we should be more humane or anything like that. What I think we should be asking about is the quality of the pathologist's reports. One of the pathologists said the chances of two cop deaths in one family are one in 73 million. It turns out, if anything, it's about one in a hundred, and it may be even less. The other one concealed, it seems to me, uh, evidence of a, a severe staph uh, infection in the second child. Uh, these are questions which I think are more serious because I think it's very difficult to say whether two cop deaths are, um, in one family means murder. Um, but I think what we have to say is that in these cases you must have pediatric uh, pathologists, not general pathologists, because <coughs> a pediatric patho um, pathologist knows more about child development and baby development and immune systems and, and so on than the general one who goes around, you know, as in movies mm. and uh, things, you know, just uh, uh, picking up. They did ask, things. they did ask, I heard this evening uh, in a discussion about this, the lawyer for mm. Sally Clark said that they did ask for a child pathologist, a yes. pediatric pathologist, and the police apparently said, no, no, our pathologist is adequate. But he was a general pathologist, yes, he was doing all sorts indeed. of murder the cases. The man in the yellow tie there. Just have to look at the pictures of her uh, before her trial and uh, the pictures that we saw her on her acquittal at the Court of Appeal. <coughs> it's ruined her life. It's possibly gone a long way to ruin uh, many uh, good other lives as well. Uh, I was going to raise the point that Anne Leslie did mention uh, about that uh, the pediatrician who gave that grossly misleading statistic. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of thing that's got to be eradicated from our system. What okay. saddens me oh, is that... So, hold on a second, Anna, come back to your moment. The, ma the man there with the black... Yes, you said. No, you've got a black shirt on, right. at least it looks like it. Right, yeah. sorry. Yeah, um, it seems to me as though, uh, from what we've heard, that some information has been withheld as well, vital information, and it makes me wonder whether um, our justice system, our, our system is trying to actually determine the truth or just gain a conviction. Right, okay. And, and right. you, ma'am, in, 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 in the front row, yes. Although this uh, pathologist wasn't a paediatric pathologist, is he, is he going to face any charges? Well, he's having some we, inquiries we, made at the moment. We're this vital evidence. Mm -hmm. Mark Oakley. I think there's several issues we need to learn from the case. Uh, the, the first is just the length of the whole procedure when somebody has got such a strong case for appeal. Why does it just take so long? Secondly, there was and has already been an appeal and they went through the appeal process and none of this came up even through that appeal process. So what went wrong there? Thirdly, the jury asked for some of this information to be given to them, but it was actually withheld from the first jury, so something's gone wrong there. And then finally, I think we do need to learn much more 
about the whole question of cot death, postnatal depression, all of these issues, there is so much misinformation and lack of understanding. So I hope from what is a, an awful story, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely story in another way, the, the way in which a husband and wife just hung together and stayed through this so strongly. I hope some good can come of it, and never again, when this kind of thing is raised again, will we have the kind of medical evidence just brushed over. I think some very serious questions will be asked in every court case which follows, and that at least will be some good that's come from this awful case. But the tragic thing is that the thing about the Clarks, they were a loving, middle-class, legally trained couple. They could go on fighting. There are other cases of women who are in prison, who are working class, who don't have that uh, knowledge, who don't have that clout, who don't have stars like Martin Bell, you know, campaigning on their behalf. And I think that is really seriously dangerous. Okay. Man in the front row here. And yeah, I'm surprised that uh, such a grossly misleading statistic like that wasn't picked up by somebody else in the court mm. at the time when it was read out. Mm. Or by a colleague, indeed. Or either by the yes. judge or the jury. I mean, if I was yeah. in the jury and heard a statistic like that, the first thing I'd do is, you know, check out that fact for myself, because it even sounds completely ridiculous. George Galloway. Well, yeah, statistics, damned lies and statistics are used all the time to bamboozle people and unless they've got the expertise to challenge it, they often go unchallenged. But the original question was about the presumption of innocence and I actually think the presumption of innocence is being steadily and quite dramatically eroded in this country. We've seen it in a number of cases recently, paedophile cases for example, where the media find somebody guilty or rape cases, where they've found somebody guilty before the matter has even uh, started the due legal uh, process. We've seen it in terrorist uh, cases and in this case I think you're right. The woman was held to be uh, responsible for proving her own innocence and of course the process of the trial was appalling. I just say this David lastly, if this woman had lived in Texas she'd have been electrocuted by now and so no. for those, for those who, who still cling to the idea that it's a good idea to execute people and have the death penalty this woman, for killing two children, would have been executed by now. Right. It does talk a lot of nonsense. I'm against the death penalty, right, but they don't execute women who've been accused but of... Move that's on. not true. Yeah, that's absolutely sorry, untrue. I'm They've sorry. just done it I'm in sorry. America. They've yeah. just killed a woman who right. killed her children. She drove them into a lake and let them drown. Yes, that you was not You do talk nonsense, death. Anne. You do talk nonsense. She was convicted of murder. She was convicted of murder. I don't and in the, death in the United You're States, rubbish. in the United States, a woman has just been executed for precisely this, not killing her deaths. children. Not These were deaths. not caught deaths, they were murder according to All the right. jury. They, they should have All their right. own show. Yeah, no, <laughs> yes. well, I think we're really moving around down. in a moment. Do calm right. down. Oh, Robin, God, you're Robin, telling me to calm Robin down. Robin McConnell, please. <laughs> Mr. He's McConnell, can you stir things up for us? <laughs> Do you think John Prescott, as a former active union official, is right to change the law to end a, a democratically balloted strike by the firefighters. Mark Oakley. It's gone on too long. I've got concerns about this dispute because clearly with the troops who are having to step in and the pressure that may be on them in the next couple of months, we need to settle this very quickly. But because we need to settle it quickly, I actually think Prescott is wrong. If you really want to resolve this issue, then the kind of macho language which he's talking about, about forcing a government settlement on these individuals is actually just going to harden opinion amongst the firefighters. What I think we should put in place is some form of compulsory arbitration so that we actually force both sides to get back round the table and discuss this issue. What's compulsory the arbitration? Compulsory arbitration, basically what the government are Supposing talking about. Supposing they disagree, like, what do you do then? Well, this should be the next step that is taken. Now, it may very well be that we end up with a point where you do have to impose a settlement, but we're not there yet. The uh, sorry, to be what this is compulsory stage. arbitration? You go to jail if you don't go to the mm. arbitration? You no, get it, fined? Or what? How do you work compulsory you, arbitration? You require both sides to go around, sit around the table, and actually have independent arbitration. But what's your clout to do that? The, s the same clout that the government is suggesting and putting in place, that ultimately there'll be an end process where you will have to take control on this. But at the moment, the government aren't talking okay. about getting around Bernard the table. Jenkin, what do you think about Prescott's intervention? Well, what John Prescott's actually talking about is t taking powers to impose a settlement, but that won't actually settle the strike. Uh, what he has at his disposal now is powers which the la Labour government used in the 1970s to stop a fire strike, when they decided it was a threat to public safety, and they keep saying it is a threat to public safety, they could apply to the court for an injunction and stop the strike now. 
and that's what we're suggesting he, d he should do, and then there would be uh, nowhere for the union to go, but I suppose compulsory arbitration. You would actually but, say you would stop, the, stop the strike. Stop what would you, the strike do, what would you do if they refused to go back to work? Well, uh, uh, what you do is you put an injunction on the union to stop organising the strike. That's legislation that's worked, worked before, and it's legislation that a Labour government has used And before. if they ignore it, what do well, you do? Well, it will work. Uh, it's worked before, has been used before, and it will work. Uh, the, the tragedy of the present strike is that the firefighters have been led up the garden path by their union. Uh, the leader of the fire brigades union is like a latter-day Arthur Scargill. Uh, he's led his people up a blind alley. There's no possibility that the government is going to give any kind of settlement along the lines that he's suggesting. And in fact, the longer that it goes on, like Arthur Scargill's miners, uh, the more firefighters are going to lose their jobs and the more fire, fire stations are going to be closed by the okay. government. Let me go to the question. It would be far better if they got back to work to start with, took the pressure off the armed forces, which is a disgrace and uh, shouldn't be happening, and, and settled down to the practical discussions about how to settle the dispute rather than carrying on with what is now quite obviously a pointless strike. And I fear most of the firefighters know that, All right. but they don't know how to get out of Robin it. Robin McConnell, what do you think? You asked the question. What's your view? I would like uh, a negotiated settlement. I'd be very concerned about any imposition of law. As a trade union member for most of my working life, it would go against the grain for me to have the, the, the weight of the law to decide this strike. And I think there's a world of difference between Andy Gilchrist and Arthur Scarborough. Okay. Mr Gilchrist at least took, took the action on the back of a democratic ballot, which Mr Scargill didn't. Okay. And, and you, sir, in the third row there. Um, just a couple of points. Being a trade union official myself, I believe Mark Houghton is correct. There has to be a negotiated settlement. Um, I think Mr Jenkins is an absolute disgrace when he calls firefighters idiots. I never call them idiots. Um, I believe if, if Mr Jenkins' house was burning down, would he, is he saying he would ring up a bunch of idiots? Um, I think he's a disgrace, well, I certainly there has to be a settlement. I, I certainly think the fire brigade's union are a bunch of idiots because I think they've led the firefighters up the garden path. Rubbish. And, uh, uh, but the firefighters themselves, I think they're a fantastic bunch and uh, they should be recognised as such. And this union is... Is that, rec is that recognised by 4% in job cuts? And well, can I just point yourself out... The, 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 the the thing is, the, I, I'm in Parliament at the moment to speak for the armed forces. They haven't had a 4% increase in years. The average squad is... <laughs> Sorry, are you saying that the firefighters, the firefighters who you admire aren't any longer supporting the strike? I think you'll find... Or you quite admire them, but they are supporting the strike, well, which I, you disagree with. I admire the work they do, which is frequently difficult and dangerous, but the soldiers who are doing that job, uh, when the firefighters are on strike, are already paid much less. They have to modernise. It's called the Queen's Regulations. They don't have a chance to go on strike to negotiate their terms of conditions. They also can be called overseas, possibly to die for their country. And uh, I think it's a disgrace that the, that the, that the fire brigade's union is disrupting... Uh, the family lives of soldiers who may be going abroad to fight for their country uh, when uh, they are, the firefighters themselves are already paid substantially more than soldiers. You, you convinced by that? And they get second uh, jobs. Absolutely not. I'm sure the firefighters would love the sort of pay rise Mr Jenkins had uh, and other MPs had over okay. the last few years. The, the lady in the fourth row there, you man. Mr Blair wants to stop pussyfooting about and Sorry, give right. him a decent wage. Stop pussyfooting about. <laughs> George, <laughs> George Galloway. Firefighters, every time they turn up for work, are ready to die for their country. And the union is not some other. The union is made up of the brave men and women that if you call them 999 tonight, will be ready to plunge into a burning building for money that Bernard Jenkins wouldn't get out of bed for. Let me assure you about that. So what do you when think of John Prescott's action? I think it's a despicable act. And I think that it has turned the stomach of genuine, decent Labour people the length and breadth of the country. And I hope he knows that he's being made a patsy by the Cabinet when they put him up to do it. The man with his credentials, his background, his trade union history, to be put up to stab the firefighters in the back is an absolutely despicable act of treachery. He never looks so... <laughs> he, never, he never looks like, like, a, like a patsy. But no, and I, 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 was, I was one of those campaigning for him to be the leader of the Labour Party in 1994. And I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely, well, I think he might have done a better job than uh, has been done. But anyway, 
he didn't get the job. But I'll tell you what job he's got now. The job he's got now is to be put up to spit on his own history, to spit on everything he used to believe in. And these firefighters are an integral part, a pillar of the Labour Party. They've stood by the Labour Party in dark days and for the government to be effectively um, making them forced labor, because that's what it's called, this binding arbitration and forcing them back to work. That's called slavery in other countries. The police okay. men, men and women, men and women in a free country are entitled. Look, if we've got money to go around the world setting fire to other people's countries, we've got money to pay the firefighters a decent right. wage. George Galloway, thank you. And Leslie, and the Brief, I've always like. thought that this uh, whole dispute was a question of lions, i.e. the firefighters led by donkeys, i.e. the FBU. And now we're going to put in another donkey, try and sort it out, <laughs> John Prescott. <laughs> uh, uh, what I believe is that uh, the FBU made such a mess of this dispute with a 40% increase, which is more than, you know, nurses were getting and so on, and this idea that uh, George has is that all the firefighters do all the time is running into uh, buildings rescuing, you know, burning babies. Any time. Nonsense. Any time. Ten percent of their time is spent on that. I they don't know which ten percent. Uh, exactly. No, no I respect. And, I respect And the them. rest of the time they're dragging out people from traffic accidents yes, and doing things no, like that. No, they're not doing it. Yes, they're they doing are. a lot of other things. They are doing that. What they have an enormous increase in work. Uh, this is somebody who gets £100,000 a year for pontificating in a oh, newspaper. How, how do you know about my, my salary? All right, now before you do, I work, I before you do start because again, I work for the same it's like having terrible twins on the programme. Uh, Look, could you... Could why you, don't we do a musical yeah. act? At well, the let's, end of let's, the no, let's, let's do the, let's do John Prescott and the union uh, um, the, the credit of taking the issue seriously. Could you just answer this mm -hmm. and then we'll move on. Do you think that John Prescott is right to change the law to try and bring an end to the strike? I think that uh, yes no? probably it's the only alternative, particularly if we are on the brink of war. I'm sorry that it's going to be him in charge. And he hasn't got to change the law. There are sections of the law, 1947 and so on, which will enable him to do it. So he's not having to change the law. I think, in fact, if we went to war, I think the firefighters themselves would call off the strike and settle for what they're offered. Okay, I'm going to take one more point from the man in the yellow tie there who's waving his hand vigorously, and I would have brought you in, but I'll bring you on the next one. Yes? Yeah, it's been reported by uh, John Prescott that the uh, strikes cost £70 million pounds of the taxpayers' money. Isn't it time that the strikes ended now? A million a day is what he says. Yeah. Well, that's your view. Okay, yeah. uh, on that note, I'm going to move on. And this is a question, please, from Claire Strain. Claire Strain. Are the Conservatives trying to sneak the asylum seekers issue onto the anti-terrorist bandwagon in order to gain popular support for it? Conservatives sneaking the asylum seekers issue onto the anti-terrorist bandwagon to gain popular support. George Galloway? Yes, they are, and not only the Conservatives. Many others uh, from whom it's less expected are doing the same thing. This conflation of asylum, immigration, race, Islam and war and terrorism is being made deliberately to stir up people's feelings against the other, against the alien, to build support for war by Bernard Jenkins' party and also by some people who should be even more ashamed of themselves. Don't get me wrong. Who are the I people who should that, be even uh, more ashamed I, of themselves? I, I, well, there are all sorts of people who are making the most reckless statements. I'll, 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 I'll just name one of them the Home Secretary, David Blunkett, who actually lectured people on speaking their own language in their own house. He said they'd get schizophrenic if they didn't speak English, even in their okay. own houses. And I think that that kind of uh, casual, reckless statement helps build the kind of support for racist ideas that led to a fascist party winning a seat on the Halifax Council just a couple of days ago. We need to cool this issue. All responsible people of whatever political stripe, if they want to have a harmonious country, should be cooling this issue down, not inflaming it by throwing petrol on the fire. Okay. <laughs> Bernard, Bernard Jenkins. Bernard Jenkins. 
Well, it is, gets to a pretty pass, doesn't it, when you cannot actually discuss what is a very major issue, which mm. is the question of asylum, um, because some left-wing lunatic is going to jump on you and say you're stirring up a, a racist war. I tell you what, what uh, gives, the, uh, gives a purchase for the, for the fascists to win uh, council elections. It's the complacency of politicians who somehow think this doesn't matter, so that people who live in areas uh, where they have high ethnic po uh, populations begin to feel genuinely afraid about who is living in their area. So what we've got to do is, first of all, get a grip of who is coming in and out of our country, get control of our borders, make sure that we identify the terrorists before they come in so that people don't think that's an asylum seeker, that must be a terrorist. Because that is, that is the situation we've got because we have lost control of the asylum issue. We also need to look at uh, uh, giving genuine refugees a fairer deal because they're the people that get caught up in all this because the asylum system is overloaded with, with uh, people who aren't genuine asylum seekers. We need to address, this is the policy we announced this week, the whole question of Article 3 of the Euro European Commission on Human Rights, which stops... Uh, even if you identify a terrorist who's come in pretending to be a asylum seeker, you can't deport that terrorist back to their country of origin under the European Commission on Human Rights. That's clearly crazy. Uh, we've got a, a lot of work to do, but the government has got itself tied in knots. It's desperately split on this issue, and the, and the issue is going nowhere. So I make no apology for launching a policy this week to deal with the fact uh, that it is quite obvious that one of the ways that the terrorists were trying to get into this country is by walking in and claiming an asylum, or even s getting into this country and then claiming asylum as a from in country. The, the, the woman in the second row. The I'm a wife of a genuine asylum seeker who was actually deported back to Kosovo this Sunday, and um, and we had a horrendous time trying to do everything by the book. and We actually paid for him to go back, and we did everything by the book. We paid for legal advice and things like that, and all the time it really opened my eyes, seeing how many people, how many false claims and things. But what I'm actually saying is, as my husband, he's been my husband for 15 months, we've been together for three years, we were stopped quite a few times um, he, on, when he was in the car, and he was stopped by police sometimes and saying, What's your name? Are you a Muslim? Are you? And he, the last few years has been very difficult. And it's opened my eyes to what black people have had to encounter, because I live in Birmingham. And, it was, and he's now back, and we're trying to go through the process from Kosovo. Now it's, we ha can't do it in Kosovo because they... What, sorry, but what do you think of the, of the government and the Conservative Party's uh, attitude to asylum seekers? Well, I'm not, um, not, very <laughs> not very good. Um, I'm, I d do appreciate it's the, the whole system is absolutely choking at the seams. And uh, people, my colleagues, my friends cannot believe that we've tried, we are real, with, um, with, you know, I'm British and we're married, but we can't, we've done everything by the book. And yet, it, it's, the system is just too vast, the corruption, the bribery and... Uh, there's so much to say, okay. but it's... Okay, and yeah. Leslie's nodding in agreement, and Patrick Jenkins, uh, Bernard Jenkins, sorry, I've done that before, is <laughs> nodding in agreement. Um, well, I, I totally agree. The problem is a complete shambles. So nobody can tell who is genuine, who is not, the amount of corruption, the false ID cards, and so on and so forth. And it's got to the stage where, frankly, if Saddam Hussein... Uh, George's great friend, with whom he shares so many... No, please, uh, let's just stick to the point. <laughs> let's not trade insults. Let's try and could, get these questions answered. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. he could do is he could send his entire Republican Guard to Dover, where they could uh, then uh, claim asylum and be allowed in and disappear into the woodworks. It is a shambles. And so your husband is suffering as much mm. as anybody from the shambles. Mm. I think and the fact that he's a Muslim, this is, has been a situation because he's a Muslim. He's had really quite a bad experience. Um, but we've been stopped, he's been stopped many times in the car uh, and look for papers and your surname and it's, we've really noticed okay. it a lot. Okay, the, the man in the, in, in the dark pool over there, second in, yes, you sir. I've been, I've been friends with a, a Muslim who, for like uh, a year now and uh, I've been dri uh, he, he's a driver and I've been in his car for the past year now and he hasn't been stopped once. So how, how can you claim 
that uh, just because he's being stopped in his car, he's a claim, on, he, just because he's an asylum seeker. Okay, and you, sir, in the front here, uh, with the blue, sh blue sh tie on. Yes, um, I think it's about time we move back to conservative-based principles, where compassion is exercised with uh, objectivity and it would enable them to everybody to get a control of this situation. Right, so you would, you would, would want to see the law toughened up and, and asylum seekers imprisoned while they're checked or, or, or put in, in a turn, secure... Rather, rather in than turn imprisoned, while they're yeah, imprisoned is an emotive term, but yes. certainly compassion with objectivity. Yes, and, and you, madam, in, in the... Yes, you in the pink. Yeah. Uh, yes, because I think that 95% of these are not asylum seekers, they are illegal immigrants. Okay, you think they're not genuine? And and I all right. <laughs> yes, no, no, don't read it, just say, say what speak I your mind. What I must say is yes. that all Mr Blair says is more dramatic steps need to be taken. How true. Let's get rid of him as Prime Minister. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the, the man in, in the front row here on the left, please. Okay, I mean, I, I find it quite amazing that so-called intelligent people can sit there and just for a small political gain they can kind of uh, attack these asylum seekers I'm and say why are they coming here seekers. being a second generation my father who, was, who came here uh, through asylum the reason why these people come here the reason why these people they uh, they get on board things that can hardly be called boats to escape what's happening in their lands and the devastation that has been caused on their lands is directly due to the colonization of their lands by the West, and these people, they come to seek refuge okay. from these. So if you want to solve the problem of asylum seekers, then I think you really need to go deeper on this mm. and kind of solve the reason why these people are coming from these. Right. Mark uh, I, I sh I, It's worth acknowledging that I think Bernard's language tonight was, was tolerant and measured on this issue. Unfortunately, not all politicians have actually taken that position, and I've heard some pretty outrageous remarks in the past. It is difficult as a politician because, you know, you want to get clapped by an audience like this, but I'm going to say things that you probably won't agree with and you might want to boo about, but I feel very passionately that we ought to have a much more tolerant approach on this whole issue, that we ought to not have inflammatory language and we ought not to have this rather macho battle in some of the right-wing press to see who can work up the nasty headlines on asylum seekers. There is a lot of nonsense written about, frankly, on this issue. What I do think needs to happen is that we must, yes, speed the process up, I don't think it's going to be effective to start ripping up international treaties. I don't think the Conservatives' idea of building these centres all over the country is practical. It will cost a lot of money, and even in their own shadow home secretary's constituency, nobody wants the suggested centre there anyway. What we must do is speed the process up, tackle this, and also work with our European partners so that they do also take some of the burden of this issue as well. Okay. <laughs> The woman in the, in the second row, are you madam? And then I'm going to, you know, yes. Could we also cover the, co the cost to the National Health Service of the asylum seekers coming in with the health risks that they bring with them, i.e. TB, <laughs> smallpox? Okay. Um, um, uh, yes, you, sir, with the spectacles on there. Thank you yes. very much. A genuine asylum seeker would come to the first country that offered him a safe haven. <laughs> And, and I, I feel that these are not genuine asylum seekers when they're prepared to hang off the back of trains, sit in freezing lorries and come to a country which they think is a soft touch. Okay. Right. Well, we, we, t we, talked about, we talked about asylum seekers last week and this week and no doubt next week as well because it's a, a key issue. But I want to go on to a final question from Richard McDermott. Richard McDermott, please. Yes. Um, What's the panel's views on the new sex laws, ref sex law reforms outlined by the Home Office, which allows gay men to engage in having sex in public lavatories? What's your view of it? My view is that I've got no problem with sexuality of any person, but I do believe that it should be done within their own private houses or yeah. hotels, but not in a public lavatory. Apparently also, uh, uh, people are allowed to do it in their bedrooms with the curtains open, uh, <laughs> if you, even if it can be seen from the street, but not in the garden. Correct, yeah. that's right. And Leslie, what do you think about these n reforms, uh, well, so-called reforms? Well, I mean, I reforms? thought public lavatories were for relieving yourself of, um, you know, um, certain uh, <laughs> fluids which were not uh, connected. Careful! <laughs> I think... I think we'd better move on to somebody else if this is going to be no, the tenor of your answer. No, but what I'm going to say is that a friend of mine who 
uh, uh, took his uh, small children into a public laboratory. He had no idea this was well known in the quote unquote gay community as a cottage. And he was absolutely thunderstruck at what he saw and the abuse he got when he said, oh, and, and the little boys were rushed out. I think public laboratories should be for their original purposes. Okay. George Galloway. Oh, she's bashed the asylum seeker. She's bashing <laughs> the gays. My God. Uh, I just think we're, I'm not too, bashing gays. we're too hung up about these things. I'm amazed we've got legislative time to legislate on this kind of rubbish, frankly. There are far more important things that we should be uh, getting down to if you'll pardon the pun, in the, uh, <laughs> in the British Parliament than where people have, uh, have, have sex uh, or not. And in I, a public I, lavatory. I mean, well, they can have it anywhere they like. Well, Why do they have to go into a public lavatory where parents, well, you know, take their small children? I mean, I, I don't even know if that is in the legislation. I very much doubt if it's framed in those terms. Uh, <laughs> I'm frankly... Well, I, I, quote, I quote Tony Benn's son, Hillary, who's the Home Office Minister involved, who said, uh, if the cubicle door is open and an offence is committed, if it's closed, it's different. I don't want well, to go into much more detail on this. Um, um, Why did uh, you choose uh, this Bernard question? Jenkins. <laughs> well, no, I, Richard McDermott asked it. Yeah. I, 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 public um, conveniences are not meant to be threatening places. They're meant to be places where uh, uh, you feel safe. And I can imagine, uh, as Anne found out, that it, n without wishing to cast any aspersions on the gay community, uh, I'm not anti-homosexual. In fact, I was one of the first Conservatives to vote for the equalisation of the age of consent. But uh, I think that public lavatories might become more threatening than they need to be. I mean, there are actually gaps under the doors, so yeah. what constitutes a closed door, I yeah. ask you? Um, um, I want to look at this legislation. I haven't yes. studied this. I think, right. I, saw, <laughs> I think I saw a picture in one of the newspapers, but decided it wasn't work to read that bit. M Mark Oaten, very briefly, because we're coming to the end. Uh, briefly, I hope we're moving to a more tolerant society where gay men don't feel they have to go and hide in public laboratories, but can actually be in society and have relationships in society. And as for the other issue about sex in the garden, I'm a liberal and a democrat, so as far as I'm concerned, you can do most things where you like, as long as the other person agrees. Uh, uh, and the neighbours. Uh, the, ma the man in the white pullover, just very briefly, if you would, sir. Is it not the case that the whole of the Sexual Offences Act actually needs to be looked at and we shouldn't be just targeting one group of people? We should look at the whole issue of, of sex offence and address it accordingly. To, yes, to be fair to, to the legislation, it does. Uh, uh, the question I just put this particular point, it does have a fairly wide-ranging effect, which we can't go into now because our hour is up. And uh, it just falls to me to thank our panel very much indeed. Uh, for, for coming here to Tamworth, to thank all you for taking part in the programme. Uh, we're going to be in Dartmouth next week, and we're going to have on the panel the former Education Secretary, Estelle Morris, uh, Eric Forth, the shadow leader of the Commons, Shirley Williams, the Liberal Democrat uh, leader in the Lords, Billy Bragg, the musician, and Ian Wilson, the novelist. Uh, those will be our five, snow permitting. And um, if you'd like to join us in Bournemouth, or if you'd like to come to Carnarvon the following week, Remember to ring this number, it's on the screen, 090 114 411, um, or go to our website, bbc.co.uk slash question time, where you can comment on tonight's programme. And if I said Bournemouth instead of Dartmouth, I can't think why uh, I go to Dartmouth much more often than I go to Bournemouth, and it's a very admirable place. So anyway, um, uh, you can comment on tonight's debate there. You can also tell us who you'd like to see on other editions of this programme. So do join us again next Thursday. In the meantime, from all of us here, good night.